If you would, please take your Bible and find the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter 2 again today. As we're going through this sermon series, How to Enjoy the Rest of Your Life. Also inside your bulletin, you'll find some sermon notes. You can follow along with the scripture and the sermon as well as from your Bible. As we're going through this sermon series, we're looking at the book of Philippians where Paul gives the instructions to be joyful, to rejoice, and to rejoice in the Lord. And he knew that from his own experience of life, that it doesn't matter what's going on around him, you've got to keep your joy in the Lord rather than in your circumstances. So our ability to enjoy life is directly related to our willingness to trust in God and what he's doing rather than trying to trust in everyday circumstances, which can be good or bad or sometimes evil. So our rejoicing is in God and not in our circumstances. So far, we've memorized one passage from the book of Philippians, Philippians 2, 3, and 4. But today, and for the rest of the series, I want us to memorize Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. This is a familiar passage to you. So let's say it together. Will you say it with me? Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your quest to the Lord. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Good. You may have memorized that in a different translation. I was getting a little confused there myself from my earlier translation. But I hope that you will make that your scripture memory for the next few weeks. This passage, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, stresses the importance of our prayer life to God and how that can help us to enjoy life with peace in our hearts and minds. And we certainly need that every day. Today we come to part 7 in this series. And the topic is how to be my best for God. Now, so far in this uh, book of Philippians, Paul has presented himself as somewhat of a model, a godly model to follow. He has presented Jesus and the humility of Jesus to follow. But today we're going to look at Paul giving us two more examples to follow, two men that he trusted, two men that he's going to talk about. Their names are Timothy and Epaphroditus. And in verses 19 through 30 of chapter 2, Paul describes some godly characteristics of these two men. And I want us to look at these characteristics so that we too can develop them in our life and be our best for God as we enjoy this life on earth. Let's begin with Timothy's characteristics. He's more familiar to you and Paul presents him and names him first. So look with me at the first characteristics on your notes there, and that is to be my best for God, I need to be available. Paul describes Timothy as a person who is available to do whatever and whenever. And two specific verses there, verse 19 and verse 23 of chapter 2, I'm going to read both of those. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I will be happy to learn how you are. And then verse 23, I plan to send him to you quickly when I know what will happen to me. Timothy's name is mentioned in the New Testament some 25 different times. So we are familiar with his name. We are familiar with him. You may remember that he was from a city called Lystra in the region of Galatia. His mother was Jewish, but his dad was Greek. You may remember that about Timothy. But Paul, on his very first missionary journey, went through this city of Lystra where Timothy had grown up. Timothy heard his preaching and his teaching. And Timothy chose, as many, other did, as many others did, to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Timothy then went on some missionary journeys with Paul. And as Paul states here, he's sending Timothy out back to some of these places as well. Timothy was a well-respected leader among several of these New Testament churches. In addition, Paul listed Timothy as a co-author in six of the books or letters that he wrote. 2 Corinthians, Philippians that we're in now, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. 
And then in addition to being a co-author to those books, Paul wrote two letters directly to Timothy. So he has two books of the Bible named after him. But in this passage that we just read, Philippians 2.19, Paul was, of course, in prison, and he longed to be with those people in Philippi. He wanted to go and see what was happening with them, but he couldn't. So his plan was to send Timothy to that congregation and get kind of a first-hand report on what was happening. And the verses that follow, as we will read, Paul explains to this congregation at Philippi different characteristics about Timothy, wanting them to understand, this is why I'm sending him to you. It's because I trust him. He's got these wonderful characteristics. But here we notice, as Paul states, I'll be happy to send him to you. I'm going to send him to you quickly. It suggests an availability of Timothy, that he's ready to go whenever, he's ready to, ready to go wherever Paul should happen to send him. Timothy was available to do whatever for the benefit of God's kingdom. Many of you have heard or maybe seen different films or shows of a magician by the name of Houdini. Many of you heard of Houdini. Houdini was known for getting out of any jail, any set of handcuffs, any straitjacket, any lock, getting out of anything as quickly as possible. He was very good at that. But you may not have known there was one jail cell he could not get out of. It was in the British Isles. Houdini was put into the jail cell. He worked for two hours, which was very unusual for him, worked for two hours trying to pick the lock of this jail cell, and he couldn't get it unlocked. Finally, Houdini, giving up in exhaustion, he leaned up against the door of the jail cell, and it went open. It was never locked. Somebody played a trick on the magician. God has many unlocked doors, and he wants us to walk through those unlocked doors, being available to do whatever and wherever. But we like to pretend as if the door is locked, and we start making up our excuses of being unavailable to God. Like Timothy, we need to be available to go whenever God should call us, wherever he should call us, to do and to accomplish ministry for God, walking in faith with Jesus, being ready to go. That's how we can be our best for God. Now look at a second characteristic as Paul continues in his letter. Number two, to be my best for God, I must be myself. In verse 20, Paul describes Timothy in this way. He says, I have no one else like him. Very unique person, isn't he? Paul had grown fond of Timothy. He mentions Timothy quite a bit. He had mentored Timothy in his faith. They'd spent a lot of time together on some of the missionary journeys. And they had a kindred spirit. When Paul says, I have no one else like him, he's talking about being like-minded. They were very similar. And essentially, Paul is saying, look, since I can't come to you myself, Timothy is my best substitute. He's going to be my best substitute to come to you. I have no one else like him. Now, Timothy was not trying to be like Paul. He was just being himself. Even though Paul was discipling him, even though Paul was mentoring him in the faith, Timothy was being himself. He was a different person in his godliness. He wasn't exactly like Paul, but he was himself. There's an old saying that sometimes we say to one another, um, something like this, well, God broke the mold when he made you. <laughs> sometimes we say that as a compliment, Sometimes we say it in a very sarcastic way, don't we? But there is some truth to that. First of all, we're all created in God's image. We're not created in each other's image. We each have unique looks. We have a unique DNA. We have a unique skills and gifts and talents and personalities. We have unique experiences of life. 
And therefore, when you die and you stand before God, God is not going to look at you and say, why weren't you more like Billy Graham? He's not going to look at you and say, why weren't you more like Mother Teresa? He's going to look at you and say, why weren't you more like you? The way I created you to be. We don't have to be like each other. We have to be ourselves as we grow in more and more to be like Jesus. So if we want to be our best for God, we just need to be ourselves, the way God has created us to be. Now look at a third characteristic of Timothy here. Number three, to be my best for God, I must be compassionate. So I want to be available, I want to be myself, but also have this godly characteristic of compassion. In verse 20 again, we'll read the rest of verse 20. Paul says, I have no one else like him, and here it is, who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. The idea here of who takes a genuine interest in your welfare is to be burdened for another person, or in this case, a group of people. Again, Paul is saying to them, Timothy is my best substitute. Why? Because he cares for you. He's burdened for you. He has a compassion, and he will do what is best for you as a congregation. He will do and give his best for God. Concerning compassion, I came across this statement. Of course, it's very true. You know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But here's the statement. The golden rule is of no value unless you realize it's your move. <laughs> to exercise, to obey the golden rule, we have to take initiative, don't we? Demonstrate compassion to others. To be your best for God, we take initiative to be compassionate. We take initiative to look out for the interest of other people. Our memory verse that we started with in this series, Philippians 2, 3, and 4, part of it said, each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also what? To the interest of others. And that's what Timothy had. He had a burden for people to look out for their best interests, to be compassionate. A fourth characteristic, look at number four. To be my best for God, I must be Christ-minded. So the reason Timothy was compassionate is because he was concerned about his mind being like Christ. Paul said it this way in verse 21, for everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. I think what Paul was doing here was comparing <coughs> Timothy to other leaders that they knew, Christian leaders. You may remember earlier in chapter 1, Paul stated that there were some who were preaching the gospel, some who were preaching Christ, only to bring more harm to Paul as he was in prison. They thought by expounding on the gospel, they would bring more punishment to Paul. And perhaps those are the same people he's talking about here in verse 21. Some look out for their own interest and not for Jesus Christ. But Timothy he does look out for your interest because he has the mind of Christ. He's looking out for the interest of Jesus Christ too. He portrays a godly person who's concerned about your welfare and the welfare of Jesus Christ, being Christ-minded rather than selfish. Back when I was in seminary, uh, my wife and I lived in Waco, Texas, and I commuted to Fort Worth, Texas to go to school. And so because of that long commute, I had to find other people to ride with me so I wouldn't have to drive and pay gas all the time. So we had several students that lived in Waco, and based on our schedule, we would commute together to school in Fort Worth. And of course, during that long commute, I got to know those guys really well. I had a lot to talk about. It was 90 miles one way to, to Fort Worth. But I remember one of my friends in particular he would talk about his desire and his passion that once he got out of seminary, he wanted to climb the ladder of success within the Southern Baptist denomination. Now, sadly, while I was in seminary, without realizing it, a lot of what happened at seminary was promoted to it in that way. In other words, they would parade in front of us as students all of these bigwigs from the denomination, you know, 
Like, this is what you should look like when you graduate from seminary. I thought, no, nah, I don't think I'll look like that. But anyway, this particular friend of mine, he, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to climb the ladder of success. And unfortunately, I met others in seminary that had that same passion. I lost track of him after I graduated. We left Texas, and he ended up staying in Texas. And over the years, I, I wondered whatever happened to him. And while we were living in Virginia, one of the ladies in the church in Virginia, she was uh, in charge of the preschool there that we had, she said, do you happen to know so-and-so? She mentioned this guy's name. I said, yeah, I know him. We, we went to seminary together. We rode in the car together for miles and miles. And she said, he, he's the leader of the preschool at Lifeway. I thought, well, there you go. He made it. <laughs> he wanted to climb the ladder of success, and he had made it to the top at Lifeway. Now, Lifeway, if you don't know, that's our Southern Baptist agency that produces a lot of our Southern Baptist curriculum. And they sell other things as well to many churches. But he had made it to the top. That's where he wanted to be. Well, shortly after that, he went back to local ministry. I guess it wasn't what he thought it was. <laughs> but anyway, I, I met people like that. Their desire was to climb the ladder of success rather than looking out for the interest of others. And it's sad that there are some Christians in ministry that do that, but I believe the majority are Christ-minded. They're wanting to look out for the interest of others because they have the mind of Christ. Timothy here, as Paul explains it, certainly serves as an example to us of being christ Minded. Now, look at a fifth characteristic of Timothy, number five. To be my best for God, I must be consistent. Going on to verse 22, Paul says this, And you yourselves know how he has proved his worth, how he and I, like a son and his father, have worked together for the sake of the gospel. So Paul describes Timothy here as a person whose character has been proven worthy. It's been tested and proven. And Paul reminds the congregation, you yourself saw that because Timothy had traveled with Paul to this city at one particular time. They had worked together there. They served alongside each other there in Philippi. Now, the only way for us as Christians to have a proven character that's tested and proven here is to be consistent in our godly behavior. We're not perfect but we can be consistent. And through that consistency, people will know that person has a godly character. That person has proven their worth. They've been tested. Now, the opposite is also true. Inconsistency of behavior demonstrates an unproven character, doesn't it? And you see that just as obvious. When it comes to inconsistent behavior... I am reminded of how some football teams have some inconsistent behavior. Don't want to mention any names, but their facility is about two miles north of here. <laughs> and speaking of football and uh, their inconsistency, you may remember watching Charlie Brown and the Peanuts characters. Lucy would put out a football and entice Charlie Brown to come and kick the football. And she was very consistent and always doing what? Pulling the football out from under him and he would try to kick it and go flying in the air and fall on his back. So over and over and over again, Lucy was consistent in pulling that football away, tricking Charlie Brown to kick it, and Charlie Brown was consistent over and over and over again at being gullible for the same trick, wasn't he? Happened the same way every time. We knew what was going to happen because they were consistent. So if only the Atlanta Falcons were that consistent in winning football games, but they're not. If we're going to give our best for God, if we're going to be our best for God, then consistency in our godly behavior must be a priority. Now that finishes up five characteristics of Timothy. I want us to look at two more characteristics, and this comes from the next person, Epaphroditus. So look with me now at number six. To be my best for God, 
I must be loyal. So now Paul talks about a second man, Epaphroditus. Look at with me, or look with me at verses 25, 26, and 27. Paul says, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. So he's, he's sending Timothy, but also Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. And now he says why he's sending him back. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not, only, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, unlike Timothy that we just looked at, Epaphroditus is not as well known. He's not as spoken of as much, simply because he just didn't need to be spoken of as much. He's, in fact, he's only listed here in the book of Philippians and nowhere else. He was from the church in Philippi. And the church in Philippi had decided they wanted to send some money. They wanted to send some gifts to Paul while he was in prison. And then they turned to Epaphroditus and said, here, you go and take the stuff to Paul. And he did. He went with those gifts. He went with that money. And he became a messenger and a help to Paul while he was in prison. So he was not a well-known preacher or teacher. He was not a well-known missionary like Paul. He was not even a well-known leader in the church. But Paul chose to point him out and to list some godly characteristics. Notice the five titles Paul attributes to him here in this passage. Paul calls him my brother. He calls him my fellow worker, my fellow soldier. That's how much Epaphroditus meant to Paul. And then he goes on to say, he's your messenger. He's talking to the church. He's your messenger, and he's your minister to come and help me in my need when you yourselves couldn't come. Now, I've taken all those characteristics and those titles and put them together in the idea of being loyal. Epaphroditus was loyal to Paul to help him while he was in prison. Epaphroditus was loyal to his home congregation in Philippi to say, yes, I will go and I will do this. Paul goes on to mention here that Epaphroditus had been sick. He says almost, he almost died, but then God had mercy on him, God healed him. And the congregation in Philippi had heard that somehow. They heard that Epaphroditus, their fellow brother, was sick. And they're worried about him. They're concerned about him. So this is why Paul is saying, I'm going to send him back so you can see that he's well. He wants you to know that. He's, he's been distressed about it. He wants you to know that he's okay. When we think of loyalty and having a characteristic of loyalty, many of you may think of a pet dog. Some of you have pet dogs and you know how loyal dogs can be and what a great comfort they can be to you. But when you think of loyalty you don't necessarily think of a cat being loyal, do you? And many of you have cats. I came across this story of a disloyal cat. I thought it was so funny. It happened in Tokyo, Japan. There was a man who happened to be a criminal, and he would go out at night and rob houses, but he had this pet cat. And sometimes he would take his cat with him when he went out shopping. He would take his cat with him on a trip or something. But one night he went out into a neighborhood to rob some houses. Not realizing his cat was following him. It gives a whole new meaning to cat burglar, okay? His cat followed him to this neighborhood. And he tried to rob a house. Someone saw him and he immediately took off and he ran back home. This was in Tokyo, Japan. It sounds like an American, but it happened in Japan. So the cat stayed at the house he was trying to rob. The cat didn't follow him back home. So somehow or another, when the police came, they saw this cat there, and they were able to tie that cat back to the criminal and were able to go and arrest him. And he said, the criminal said after being arrested, I loved that cat. 
I always took that cat with me, but I didn't know he was with me tonight. <laughs> Cats are not that loyal, are they? Sometimes, but not always. If we're going to be our best for God, we have to be loyal to him. Loyal no matter what the circumstances. Loyal no matter what's happening. No, uh, loyal no matter wherever he leads us. We must remain loyal to God in all ways. Now, one more characteristic, number seven, and again, this one's about Epaphroditus. To be my guest, best for God, I must be courageous. And this is the last characteristic we'll look at. Paul continues to talk about Epaphroditus. Follow along as I read verses 29 through 30. Paul says, Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Why? Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. So Paul states here that Epaphroditus had risked his life in order to come to Rome and minister to Paul in prison. Now think about what this really means. Picture yourself as Epaphroditus. Try to put yourself in his shoes. You're living in the city of Philippi. You're in a church and you're having a good time worshiping the Lord. You've made good friends there with some new Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're content, you're happy, you're joyful. But all of a sudden this church of your own friends says we need to send some money to Paul. Paul's in prison. We need to send some gifts to Paul. And let's select someone to go. And they all elect you to go. <laughs> Here, Epaphroditus, you take the money. You take the gifts to Paul. And in your mind, you're thinking, okay, Paul's in prison. He's in Rome. Who's in charge there? Oh, Nero. Nero's being mean to Christians. If I go to help Paul, I might be put in prison. And at any given moment, Nero may decide to execute Paul and then execute all the people helping Paul. Why would I want to go to Rome? <laughs> but the church elects you to go. And so with courage and faith, you take out, you step out, and you go to Rome. He demonstrated boldness and courage to go to Rome to minister to Paul. And while there, what happens? He gets sick and he almost dies. So yes, as Paul says, Epaphroditus risked his life for God's kingdom. Therefore, welcome him with great joy and honor men like him. He had great courage for God's kingdom. You may have heard this before. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is is the ability to walk forward, to move forward in the face of fear. We often think courage is the absence of fear. No, it's the ability to move forward and walk forward in faith and in the face of fear. So do you want to be your best for God? Then be courageous. What is it that you need to do in taking a risk for God today? What are the fears that are keeping you from moving forward in your faith and being courageous. Be willing to take a step of faith today and move forward in God's kingdom and do what he wants. Be courageous. That is how we can be our best for God. My invitation to you is on the bottom of your outline there. It is simply be your best for God and we've looked at different ways of doing that. When it comes to being our best for God, we all have our excuses. Some of you would say, well, Michael, I, I just don't have experience enough as a Christian to be my best for God. And some of you might say, Michael, I have made so many mistakes as a Christian. I, I just can't be my best for God. We all have excuses. And, and those are two good excuses that I've named. And perhaps you've heard yourself say those excuses before. But you know what? I'm a pastor. I have better excuses than that. Because <laughs> I thought about it too. And here's my excuse. I was my best for God last Sunday. I don't need to do it again this Sunday. And that's a good excuse, isn't it? We all have our excuses when it comes to being our best for God. 
But here's one simple truth that negates all those excuses. And the truth is that as a Christian, the Holy Spirit resides in each of us. The presence of God to help us be our best for God. The presence of the Holy Spirit takes all those excuses away, doesn't it? When you think about these two men that Paul has mentioned, Timothy and Epaphroditus, these seven characteristics that we've looked at, those characteristics did not show up inside of Timothy. They did not show up inside of Epaphroditus because they were experienced Christians who did everything right. They showed up in these men because of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. They were probably still a lot younger in their faith than we think they were. Timothy maybe had a little bit more experience in traveling with Paul, but Epaphroditus didn't. They were still young in their faith. And yet Paul took the time to say, here are some men and here are their characteristics. He pointed them out. He didn't point out any flaws whatsoever. I'm sure he could have. In other places, Paul points out flaws in people, doesn't he? He's very bold about that sometimes. But for these two men, he pointed out their godly characteristics. So yeah, you and I can be our best for God because we too have the Holy Spirit working in us, just like Paul, just like Timothy, just like Epaphroditus. Sometimes experience in life, experience as a Christian does make a difference in being our best for God. I'm not going to deny that. However, the biggest difference in your life that's going to help you is the Holy Spirit working inside of you. So I encourage you, pick one or two of these seven characteristics for this week. Just circle one or two of them that make a difference in your life today, something that you want to work on. And every morning this week, sit down in your prayer time with God and say, this is what I'm going to work on today. Or these two characteristics are what I'm going to work on today. And give of your best to display them in all that you do. And just practice that day after day, working on one or two of these characteristics. And then maybe the next week, try two more if you like. Be your best for God. Let's pray about it. Father, thank you for this scripture today in the book of Philippians. Thank you, God, for these godly examples of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. Help us, Lord, to follow these godly examples and characteristics that we read about in your word. Thank you, God, for including us in your kingdom. Thank you for explaining to us what it means to be a Christian and helping us to take a step of faith to believe in Jesus. And thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. So with that truth in mind, we make a commitment today to do our best, to be our best for you in your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.